So my friend asked me a question about archetypes from the aid function model, and I was basically thinking of ways that we could talk about them in more detail without actually having to go back and have him read pages from dense books that you know really aren't really entertaining for him to get into. So I was like, you know what, like maybe I could describe it in terms of the Matrix because that's like a movie that almost everyone's seen. But my friend was like, you know what, <laughs> we'd talked about it for like five minutes he's like you know what i actually haven't seen the matrix I'm like okay like you know how about how about we do breaking bad like my friend and i talked about that a lot before you know this it's a show that's pretty popular and most people like if you're into tv shows or movies you've probably seen breaking bad so we started off by talking about the hero archetype and obviously the hero archetype in breaking bad is represented by the character walter white and the hero archetype, the shorthand here for the eight function models is that the, the, the hero embodies the area of strength and pride and organizes adaptation and initiates individuation. So this show, really in the beginning, the character is, is, is pretty washed up. He's like a wet rag, really. Like he's, uh, he's really overqualified for his job. And then he also, at his job as a high school chemistry teacher, although he holds a doctorate degree in chemistry from Caltech, and he also... He works at a car wash as well on top of that. So the show is, it's really about the renewal of the personality of this character who is the hero. But in the beginning of the show, it's really just that he's the main character. It's not really even, uh, it's not really even that clear that he's the hero from the outset. So then we moved on, we're like, okay, so who's, who's a character that fits the father archetype or the area of fostering and protecting who nurtures and protects others so that character throughout the series is the brother-in-law of the main character hank schrader hank in the show is a dea agent and it's very interesting throughout the show as walt progressively becomes more of like an absent family man hank uh protects and cares for the or at least offers his support to the other characters the other main characters so walt's family he offers to pay for walt's cancer treatment he offers to take the children and it's funny because hank doesn't actually have children himself but even in like say the first episode uh, during walt's birthday it's clear that hank seems to be more of like the stereotypical family man than walt tends to be and despite being aware of the fact that Walt is clearly a very washed up individual, Hank still stands by Walt as part of his family. So he even, even, uh, he's aware of Walt's shortcomings, but he still treats him like he's, uh, like he's a human being. We then move to the first anima figure, and the anima, the shorthand here is that it's an area of embarrassment, idealization, and gateway to the unconscious. So we assign that to Skylar. And Skylar is, of course, Walt's wife in this series. And it's really cool to think of Skylar as an anima figure because in doing this and assigning all these characters an archetype, it's like we're, we're looking at the characters in relation to the hero or the main character. We're looking at, or, well, we're, we're looking at them as, as parts of the personality of the film itself or the, the, it's not a film, it's a TV show, uh, the TV show itself, and we're like, okay, so what, what, um, what part of Walt's personality is embodied by Skylar? And if you think about almost all of the scenes where Skylar is involved with Walt, and a lot of them are just one-on-ones, which is cool, it, it reminds Walt of all of the embarrassing parts of his life. So Skylar is there when Walt is refusing. He's being prideful and he's refusing. Um, he's refusing monetary help to pay for his cancer. And whenever Skylar is present, he can't really get away with that because she knows all these embarrassing details about him. Especially when when he's trying to lie, she can tell. All those scenes are painful and embarrassing because she can tell that he's lying. So next up, we have the puer or the male child, which is an area of immaturity in play. It's an endearing, vulnerable child who copes by improvising. So with that, we said, okay, that's it's definitely Jesse Pinkman, who was the former, he's the former student of Walt, and he was in Walt's chemistry class. Uh, and Walt meets him, and they start cooking crystal meth. And it's especially cool once you start thinking about these characters and their relation to to Walt in general. So it's like, okay, well, when when you're um, when you're with Walt, when the scene is with Walt and Hank, it um, oftentimes 
the scene centers around what they should be doing, what Walt should be doing with his family, in particular his son and his daughter. Uh, when Walt is talking to Skyler, it, uh, the scene tends to focus on his inferiorities. When the scene, is, when the scene has both Walt and Jesse, they're mostly improvising some solution to something crazy that they did together. So if they're uh, they're they're cooking meth and they come up with a, a solution to to power to basically build a, a an electrochemical cell out of some metals that they have in the RV and power the which I mean this is something you couldn't do in real life but they basically try to power uh, the the car battery with um, with chemistry and they just improvise this in the RV because they're stuck out in the desert so that's just one example but you see this in a lot of scenes where it's just Walt and Jesse and then we also have for the anima we have that it's the gateway to the unconscious or the gateway to the shadow so we have this character Gretchen who is a part of Grey Matter Industries which is the company that Walt feels like he should have been a part of and he feels like he has contributed the most to and he should have uh, he should have made a fortune off of this company. However, um, his old associates, and I guess uh, Gretchen being his old girlfriend, um, now own this company. So Gretchen and Elliot Schwartz own this company instead of Walt. It's cool to see Gretchen as an anima figure because also, just like Skylar, most of the scenes where you have Gretchen, it's just um, like most, most of the impactful scenes where Gretchen actually plays a part, it's just Walt and Gretchen. And you see that he's um, he's obviously idealized this um, this notion that the fame and the fortune that has gone to Elliot and Gretchen should really be his instead of theirs. So Gretchen comes as a gateway to the unconscious as when Walt turns down her offer to pay for his medical bills, Walt starts to turn to these shadowy figures in order to make money, in order to achieve this idealized fantasy that he's cooked up in his head. And it's cool because whenever somebody approaches him and tells him that this uh, this drug empire is really just a fantasy, uh, or and you know it's really just him trying to make up for his inferiority complex, the people pointing that out are usually Skyler or Gretchen. So a major theme in the show is that Walt keeps saying that he wants to acquire uh, a fortune to take care of his family. However, the part of the story arc that undermines that. Um, or the characters that undermine this notion. These are the demonic characters who are part of the drug dealing underground in Albuquerque. And not just Albuquerque, I think like the cartels involved in this too, in the show. I haven't seen the show in a little bit, but it's like, it starts out with this drug dealer named Crazy Eight, who Walt kills in a basement. And that's when you really first see like the, um, the demonic shadow archetypes start to emerge. Like that's when you first see it in Walt and that's when you first start to see it in the other characters because Walt is basically speaking to his demons when he um, when he first talks to Crazy Eight, which is I think the drug dealer that he has chained up in the basement. And that then takes them to Tuco. When Tuco is, um, is like a local drug kingpin in Albuquerque and he is like the first really demonic character. And the demonic characters always undermine the um, the main characters in some way like Jesse and Jesse the, the like the child character and Walt the hero are always like captured by the demonic characters or they're they're held by them against their will such as Tuco taking uh, Walt and Jesse out to like this this random ranch out in the desert and these scenes serve to undermine Walt's constant uh, insistence at his anima figures that he is, uh, he is correct in uh, his fantasies involving amassing a fortune. So throughout the throughout the series, he's telling the the anima figures, Gretchen and Skyler, oh, you know, I'm doing this for the family. And then once we get to the end, Walt, um, the character, finally admits to to the anima figure. He's saying, hey, you know, I really did this for me because you know I was good at it, and I like doing it. But it takes frequent encounters with demonic figures for him to actually admit this out loud to his anima figure. So after Tuco's killed, at least I believe this is how the story goes, I think after Tuco's killed, then uh, Jesse and Walt meet the quote unquote criminal lawyer as Jesse puts it. He's saying, you you know, if you're gonna be doing stuff like this, you need a lawyer who is like, who's, you know, kind of corrupt. So we have Saul Goodman, who's this trickster figure. So the trickster 
is embodied by an area of manipulation and paradox is mischievous creates double binds and circumvents obstacles and that's exactly what they use Saul for Saul is the lawyer that helps Walt and Jesse get out of sticky situations and basically cooks up schemes and gets them out of trouble and I thought it was really cool that Saul is referred to as like a clown throughout the throughout the series like he's not he's not really taken seriously even though he's his schemes are very powerful and people are aware of that so he's it it really digs into the archetype of a trickster or a clown or a jester because he's and it's not not just um like what you commonly think of of a clown but like the mythological representation of a of a trickster because the other characters are like they're they're weary of him because it's not just that he is like a clown like character they're also kind of afraid of him because he is very cunning so i believe it's around the same time that uh that walt and jesse meet the trickster the trickster character introduces them to the opposing personality or the area of frustration and challenge who defends by offending seducing avoiding and he's a self-critic and this character would be gus fring who it's very interesting because when Gus originally meets Walt, uh, Gus starts to criticize Walt's assertion that he believes that they are similar. So Walt is saying to Gus, you know, I, you know, I believe you're reasonable. I think you're like me in a lot of ways. And Gus begins to, to, to criticize Walt and say, you know, you know, we're not alike at all. You're nothing like me. And it's, it's funny because, the, well, not even funny. It's, it's just really, it's cool because you see that uh, that Gus embodies this uh, the self-critic or oppositional character of the Walt character. They have a lot of parallels. Uh, they both hide in plain sight, and they both have this aspiration to become drug kingpins because of vendettas that they have from earlier in life. And I also think it's interesting that in the eight function model, the oppositional character or the oppositional personality is supposed to have a characteristic of being avoiding. And this is because Gus becomes a very elusive character throughout the series. So, or even from the beginning, it's very hard to, for Walt to gain an audience with Gus. And as Walt starts to screw up more in Gus's eyes, um, some of the characters start saying, "You'll you'll never see Gus again." You know, uh, a lot of the the henchmen say, "You'll never you'll never be in a room with him again." And it's cool because he's like, it, it really embodies Walt's self-critic, especially how you have Walt. Um, chiding over and over again the the child character Jesse and telling him you know you need to stop messing up we need to get our act together you know otherwise we're gonna miss our opportunity you know and Walt starts to put a lot of undue pressure on the endearing and vulnerable child and I guess you could also say that Gail uh, Gail Bodicher I think that's his name right pronounce it uh, Gail is also kind of like a child character he's very immature in the way he's uh, his character is portrayed so he's he, you could also say he's another child or childish character the next character we have is the Senex or the next archetype I should say is the Senex and the Senex is uh, is an archetype of the wise old man and with our shorthand here we have that it's an area of limit setting and control defends by refusing belittling and activating and sets limits and the character that embodies this archetype in Breaking Bad is Mike and I really thought it was cool that Mike, being the wise old man or the Senex, which is the shadow of the of the father archetype, which is embodied by Hank, whereas Hank is an active DA agent, Mike is a corrupt cop, and Mike is a he's no longer a police officer, and he uses his skills as a cop to to uh, uh, basically be in league with like the shadow forces in the show. And the shadow forces being led by Gus or the opposing personality. Really, when the character is introduced, he's basically the character that is throughout the show setting limits for Walt. So he he belittles Walt a lot. He tells Walt uh, he refuses Walt's uh, a lot of Walt's propositions and says, you know what, Walt? Like I I know I know better, and this is not the way things are done. And he inactivates a lot of Walt's propositions. And especially from the outset, there's a bunch of scenes where he drives around with the child character and acts as a mentor for the child character. But it's um, he's, a, he's a shadowy mentor. It's not like the father archetype because even, even him being um, a mentor to the child character, he was doing it uh, at the instruction of the opposing personality, which is Gus. And it was only a setup to get to the, uh, the main character which is Walt. There's even a scene where Walt tries to 
he, tr he goes to a bar after upsetting one of uh, Gus's plans and tries to come up with, tr he tries to get Mike involved in killing Gus. He's saying like, you know, just get me in a room with him, I have a gun. And then uh, he basically just gets his ass kicked by the Senex character, the wise old man character. So after Gus is killed by Walt, we have a clear distinction between the Walter White from the beginning and the uh, character of Heisenberg, who has now become the oppositional character and taken the place of Gus Fring as the like the leader of the the shadow forces. So we've gone, we started at in the beginning with this like um, this kind of washed up character, and now we've gone through the unconscious and met all these shadow characters and there's a clear distinction in the show of when you're talking to the characters from the beginning and when you're talking to the characters in the shadow underground and like the the drug um the drug cartel underground and at this part of the show we have a real resurgence of the demonic archetype which is signified by todd which is the character who kills a kid who is collecting a spider out in the desert and we again we have this clear distinction between the walt who was just trying to raise or it, as he was saying to the anima figure he was saying you know i'm trying to protect the family i'm trying to build a fortune for the family and you know pay for uh pay for my medical bills but at this point there is a clear character of heisenberg who's just doing it because he wants to and he's in league with these uh with these shadow characters so this all culminates with the um, with the end of the show, and I know this whole thing's been spoilers, but at the end, uh, the the major shadow character is Todd's neo-Nazi uncle. I believe he's his uncle, yeah, Uncle Jack, who is the um, I would say he's like out of the compendium of all the demonic characters, he's probably the worst. He's um, this homicidal um, neo-Nazi who, uh, who kills all he kills off a lot of the characters, but he basically puts he puts a lot of the main characters into very negative situations and he really he is the major focus of the undermining portion of the show which is to say that Walt really wasn't really doing something positive by becoming a drug kingpin like he was asserting in the beginning and it's cool because it also this character creates an opportunity to develop integrity for the character for the main character so at the end uh, Jesse is basically enslaved by these neo-Nazis, and uh, Hank, the father character, has been killed by the the main demonic character, Jack. And Walt comes back as like this kind of mixture between. He has hair again, so he's like it's signifying he's a mixture between the Walt in the beginning that was kind of like this washed up wet rag, and then Heisenberg, the oppositional uh, shadow figure. So it's it's um. It's like a synthesis of the of the two, a renewal of the of the first character, and he comes back and he um, he he follows through with this opportunity to develop integrity by killing off all of the neo Nazis and freeing the child archetype, which is Jesse.